Today we're going to talk about Henry David Thoreau and Martin Luther King Jr. Make sure you've read both essays in our textbook, A World of Ideas. Okay, both these essays are talking about ethics and morality, what is right, what is just, and they're both talking about protesting. What is an effective way to protest something that is unjust? Okay, again, Henry David Thoreau is a little bit harder of an essay to read. Martin Luther King is a little bit easier to read, but they're both talking about very similar ideas. All right, so hopefully you can go back, read them again, and then proceed forward with the PowerPoint. Henry David Thoreau was a leader in the transcendental movement. This was a movement that believed in the human capacity to see beyond the sensory, that humans have a special intuition and we can see beyond the common experience and we need, need to tap into that to really understand truth and justice. So this essay, Civil Disobedience, is all sort of centered around the idea that people need to protest when something unjust is going on. For Henry David Thoreau, the unjust thing happening in his life was slavery. He completely abhorred slavery. And so to show his dissent, he decides to stop paying taxes and he willingly goes to prison to say to the government, stop, slavery is wrong. He also did not believe in the Mexican-American War. So he did not want his tax dollars to support war. So he was willing to protest in a nonviolent way. So let's go over some of the key points in the essay. One of his first points is that government is best, which governs least. And that's an interesting idea because he's basically saying people have knowledge and power within themselves and a government shouldn't be too authoritative. His second point, governments like armies are a means for people to express their will. So ultimately people do have ideas and power and a government should just help express those ideas and power and not take control over individuality. His third point, we should not abolish government but should improve it. So he's not saying we should blow up the government when we disagree. He says that we need to work towards improvement. Point number four, governments rule by majority, not by justice, and thus may improperly overrule individual conscience. Now that's important. So governments are created by the majority and sometimes the majority is not right, right? They're not, the majority may not have the right mentality or the right views or the right morality, but unfortunately a government is, is made up of a group of people. The American government, which supports slavery, forces men of conscience into resistance. So when a government is doing something that a man of conscience does not believe is right, that man is forced to resist. And finally, those, those who believe in abolishing slavery should withdraw their support by refusing to pay taxes and go willingly to prison. So Thoreau is saying, you know what? If you're a person of conscience and you believe something is wrong, you better stand up and do something about it and you better be willing to face the consequences, right? It's, it's important that you stand up, you express your opinion because it's within you, your opinion is, is beyond your sensory experience, you, you know what's right in your heart and you must be willing to support that at all costs. Okay, so the first quote, quote, the only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do any time what I think right, end quote. So Henry David Thoreau is saying, you know what? The only thing that I have to do, the only obligation, the only responsibility that I have is to do what I feel in my conscience is correct. So while the government may have rules and laws and expectations, the only thing I am responsible for is following what I think is right. This quote to me shows the importance of the individual, that the individual has power, his or her opinion and conscience is important to acknowledge, and that's key. All right, the second quote. The progression from an absolute monarchy to a limited monarchy, from a limited monarchy to a democracy, is progress toward a true respect for the individual. Again, interesting quote. We're talking about changing of governments. So when we go from more of a dictatorship to ultimately a democracy, that change 
can only occur when the government acknowledges the individual's power. Again, it's similar to the first quote that people have power, that a person's conscience, right? Again, we're going to this concept of the transcendental movement, that people understand inherently what is right and we need to honor that. A government needs to honor what a person believes and the person needs to honor himself as well. In Letter from Birmingham Jail, Martin Luther King is writing a letter to clergymen. Now remember, the clergymen are people who are supposed to be promoting love, acceptance, and tolerance. But the clergymen were trying to tell Martin Luther King not to protest. Martin Luther King was trying to integrate the buses in Alabama, and he participated in a very nonviolent sit-in, and he was rebuffed. He was rebuked by the clergyman. And so Martin Luther King is sitting in jail after being arrested from a sit-in. And he's writing to these clergymen saying, you know what? It is not just my right to protest. It is my duty. So let's talk about some of the key points. King urges people to obey just laws, but people have a moral responsibility to disobey any law that conflicts with the law of God. This, this idea is very similar to Henry David Thoreau. People need to understand when a rule or a law is unjust, and people must react accordingly. Point number two, King was concerned with the issue of ends and means. He felt that the means could taint the desired ends. For example, those who nonviolently defend segregation use a moral means to achieve an immoral end. Now, this is very different from Machiavelli, right? But King is trying to set the idea that, you know what? People who use nonviolence to support slavery or segregation or any type of oppression, you're doing something correctly by using nonviolence, but the end result is not okay. So we have to have, have moral means and moral ends, okay? The, the end goal needs to be has to be achieved through moral means, if that makes sense. So ultimately, his third point, passive resistance, nonviolence is key. When people are confronted with injustice, people must respond in a nonviolent way, but people must respond. It is a moral obligation. It is your right and moral obligation to fight something that is unjust. All right, let's look at specific parts of the text. Let's read quote number one. Quote, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. I like this quote. It's basically saying that freedom is never really given to people. People have to fight for it. So when something is wrong, people need to yell. They right? you need to demand what is right. You can't just sit around and expect something to be given to you. I like that idea. And it's through painful experience that we know that it, freedom is never voluntarily given, right? You need to ask for it and demand it. Quote number two, quote, a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral code or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law, end quote. I like this quote. It's, it's a definition of a just law and an unjust law. But I like this idea of a moral law and a moral code. All right. So a just law sort of inherently acknowledges what is right and good with the moral law and the law of God. Things that are universal that we should all accept. An unjust law is out of harmony with what is inherently good. So what should we do about that? We need to fight against it. An unjust law may be a law, but it is out of harmony. It is not balanced. It's, it's floating and it needs to be realigned, 